Hello, and welcome to the Overcoming Imposter Syndrome Through Adaptability. This session is part of Hamilton Arts Council's Professional Development Series 2021. Hamilton Arts Council serves arts communities within the greater Hamilton area, including Ancaster, Dundas, Flamborough, Glanbrook, Hamilton, Stony Creek, Waterdown, and Six Nations of the Grand River. We acknowledge that this area is situated upon the traditional territories of the Erie, Neutral, Huron-Wendat, Haudenosaunee, and Mississaugas. The land is covered by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, which is an agreement between the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabek to share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. We envision a dynamic arts community that is innovative, impactful, diverse, and professionally sustainable. I hope you've had an opportunity to explore all of the upcoming professional development sessions between October and December in 2021. You can find these via our website, www.hamiltonartscouncil.ca, click programs and then click professional development. All sessions are free to attend and presented in partnership with the City of Hamilton's Tourism and Culture Division. If you have any questions or comments regarding this program or any other program from Hamilton Arts Council, I invite you to email me, David, and you can contact me via community at hamiltonartscouncil.ca. And at this point, I'm very happy to invite today's <laughs> presenter, Nancy, Nancy Watt, and I'm going to turn the session over to you, Nancy. Thanks for being here. Thank you, David. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Um, David, right off the bat, I got to say how much I love your voice. As soon as he hit record, his your whole countenance changed. All of a sudden, you turned into like my favorite radio voice. Hello, and welcome to the professional series of the Hamilton Arts Council. How cool is that? I love that. I appreciate being... that. Thank you. <laughs> Seriously, this is being emotionally and intellectually invested in, in uh, performance and presentation. I appreciate that. So for our participants here today and our future listeners, I'm just giving David a shout out for that. Um, I do welcome you and I am so happy to be here. I am a fan of this organization. I love and we are well aligned intellectually and emotionally for what we do and why we do it. Uh, some of you know me and some of you do not. My name is Nancy Watt. I have a company called Nancy Watt Communications, which is a creative agency that takes evidence-based academic research into the psychology of collaboration, communication, creativity, uh, building cohesion in teams. And I explain that research using the tools and techniques of improvisational theater. I'm from a place called Second City in Toronto and Chicago, and I did their conservatory improv and comedy sketch writing programs there, as well as a bunch of other, blah, you know, uh, stuff. Listen to that, right? Did you just hear what I did? Nah, never mind. I discounted what I do. In about four slides, I'm going to talk about how that is a characteristic of imposter syndrome. So holy smoke, Sheila and David, I'm opening with a little bit of forced humility. Um, it is my, it is always my intention and my strong anecdotal experience that the best workshops are the ones where I hear you, I, you get to participate. So while we can have a Q&A after, I would much prefer it if when you have a question or a comment or an antidote or where you can, um, you know, add your own voice and experience, I welcome you to do so. This is indeed an active, interactive and engaging workshop where you will be experiencing some improv activities, experiencing what it is like to be adaptable and to substantiate what the social science and research is talking about with regard to both the imposter syndrome and human adaptability. Let's get started. Let's get started. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I have a friend who is an artist in Prague. His name is Miguel Tripic, and he, with his permission, I share with you this piece of art as he blurs the line between the artist and the art. Everything we do is a piece of us. 
You know, we experience, thank you, Anita. Oh, I'm going to love this chat. I'm in the right crowd today to have a good, to have a good chat. Talk to me and I will talk back. And I'm working on a couple monitors here on my life board so that we can do that. We can be with each other. I like this too. I am a creative as you are, and we write or we perform or we, we create and it is very hard to separate the art from the artist. This is in the uh, National Gallery of, of Poland and he is uh, um, a well-known artist. And it strikes me that everything, everything I create is a, is a piece of me and I learn from everything I do, including in spite of and because of the fact that imposter syndrome is alive and well, especially poignant, especially resonating in the arts and creative community, in part because so much of our work is, is judged, you know? And uh, we, can, we can find how we add to that judgment by having this syndrome and the nasty inner critic that goes along with it by a show of hands or in the chat, how many people are have a passing familiarity? How many people know what improv, or I beg your pardon, <laughs> imposter syndrome is? Give me a wave. Yes, yes, yes. David, I like how forcefully you're waving. <laughs> Right? We do. We really do. Um, so from the research, you might recognize, uh, you might recognize the signs of imposter syndrome when we um, agonize over, I thought it was just me. Love you, Anita. Heck yes, Jess. Do we agonize over small mistakes or flaws in our work? You know, when 95% is uh, something we are proud of and something we want to uh, rejoice in and, and find pride in, but that 5% is, the, is the, what stays with us. Imposter syndrome can be characterized when we attribute our success to luck or some outside factors. In fact, the American Psychological Association defines imposter syndrome as the psychological phenomenon, the inability to internalize accomplishments, that inability to, to truly own it. And by and large, when people say, well, I got lucky, right? Or, or um, other external factors attributed to that success, that is, um, yes, Cheryl, that is a huge component of uh, imposter syndrome. Sensitivity to even constructive criticism, you know, that we, that it activates the amygdala in our brain, that we view constructive criticism as a threat. And it is very difficult to, uh, to accept and internalize or act upon and appreciate that constructive criticism because, oh, heaven forbid, when that happens, people are going to find us out, you know. I don't know what they're going to find out, but they're going to find me out, you know, and it is this, it is this mask, this fraudulence, this phoniness that we, uh, that we have to uh, mentally and emotionally manage. Do you feel like you will inevitably be found out as a phony? No matter what, you know, I'll keep working and I will keep succeeding and I will excel at what I do, but we just wait. There's going to be that other shoe that will inevitably drop. And so we get on this exhausting hamster wheel of um, perfectionism and, and workaholism and extremely hard work so that we won't be found out. And I have to tell you that it costs us when we downplay our own expertise, even in areas where we are genuinely skilled, where we know that we excel, a characteristic of imposter syndrome is that we downplay that expertise, you know? And, and I tell you that it costs us because what happens when we do that is that the 
adrenaline and cortisol, the hormone in our amygdala that activates that threat response, you know, the, the fight, flight, or freeze effect of when we are living in that imposter syndrome, it can be a self-fulfilling prophecy because by the very nature of this neurological consequence of having the amygdala hijacked in the threatened response, what happens is we have increased level of adrenaline and cortisone, which in turn narrows our ability to create to be able to have cognitive functioning. The executive functions are narrowed because our body does not know that it is a real threat. Our body in that threatened state is trying to make sure we survive in the next 10 seconds, not the next 10 years. It costs us. It costs us in very real and practical ways, you know? Um, what we, what we have in our body of work, you know, when we, when people say we make things look easy, you know, when we have that, when we have that talent, whatever our creative, uh, whatever the creative skill is that we are bringing to this world, that is, that is our body of work. When we um, discount it, when we invalidate it, this is the imposter syndrome. There is where we, where we reside, you know, and it is a painful place to live. It is a painful place to live. And the ability for us to um, manage it the very first thing we need to do is acknowledge it and confront it so that we can then in turn have some very tactical maneuvering that will help us that will help us manage this go for going forward back to my slides this mask that we wear you know we think that it is a we think that it is a good place to hide, but all of the research talks about how emotionally exhausting it is and how much the, the, the toll that we pay, the very, the very dear price that we pay by living behind this, uh, this mask and negating, denying our authentic selves. You know, we pay a high price for living a fraudulent life. And very often that is self-fulfilling because of our, um, of our belief that we shouldn't be here. How did I get here? That type of thing. Voices. The voices, as I said earlier, they, the imposter syndrome comes with a voice. So some of the voices say things like, I I'm just lucky, right? Or they're gonna, you know, it's not perfect. So I discount it. That is the bane of my existence, the hamster wheel of pain that I, you know, I chase, uh, I chase excellence, but there is a fine line between excellence and, and perfection. Somehow I don't deserve it. You know, they'll know I'm a fake. Share with me, please. Share with me, please, in the chat, what, what voice, what resonates for you? What else does that nasty little uh, a nasty little voice, that inner critic. What does that say? What does that say to you? And either share it in the chat or just please share. Please, uh, please, you're not as far. Oh, my Lord, Alex, how true. You're not as dedicated. You don't need to be more committed, David. I love that. Yep. You're not as far along as you should be. The Dunning-Kruger effect is a fascinating piece of social science whereby when we initially learn something, we, um, we, are, uh, we, are, we have what the educators call effective gain, which is an emotional willingness to learn. But once we start to learn on that on-ramp of whatever it is we need to learn, we become cognitively aware that we that there is that much more to learn and that others are farther ahead, which tends to be discouraging. And we can and and the imposter syndrome can intervene right there. I'm quite sure I'll be found out. Thank you, you guys. This is beautiful. It is courageous and vulnerable, which is, of course, the same thing. Many others could accomplish. Yeah, 
I so identify with that, Lisa. Oh my God. You're not special. Anybody could do this. Anybody, anybody could do this. Thank you. It's exactly what I wanted, exactly what I had hoped that you would have the, um, the courage to share. I thought it was just me. Yep, I actually pointed out flaws, didn't work to, oh my Lord, Cheryl, I've done that too. Just so you know, it wasn't 100%. Let me, let me share with you that there, there was indeed this one flaw. Oh, heavens, I'm grateful to you. I'm grateful to you. We are well on our way. This voice, this nasty, nasty inner critic is one that we need to confront. And we're going to learn to think objectively and with some business acumen. And we're going to learn to think like a lawyer. The causes are interesting. You know, there's uh, been a significant amount of research into what um, what causes such imposter syndrome? And interesting research out of Stanford shows that upwards of 70 to 80 percent of people actually suffer from imposter syndrome. And while the earlier research said that it was mostly uh, that women were disproportionately being affected by imposter syndrome and uh, to a larger extent um, uh, minorities and underrepresented, the um, that is understood because we, that the, the, by the very nature of their experience, when they are told that in subtle and powerful ways that they do not belong, when they get there, there is a, a feeling of fraudulence, you know, belonging goes a huge way to combating imposter syndrome. What do you think? Give me a guess. Either out, unmute yourself or, um, or in the chat. What causes this? I've shared the the immigrant experience, the uh, underrepresented, that not not belonging. What other? Um, there's some family history stuff that the research shows really uh, impacts the imposter syndrome. Absolutely, Jess, for sure. Self-esteem, overcompensating for a bit. <laughs> yes. Ego, stay tuned for that, David. We absolutely, ego plays into this for sure. What our, um, what the research is showing us is that um, when we come from a family where achievement is, is overly valued, highly valued, we, it can be great a uh, breeding ground for imposter syndrome. When we have, when we come from a family that is uh, it high in conflict and inconsistency, or perhaps alcoholism in our family, that is a huge, that is a huge variable to this. When we come from a family that prides itself on perfectionism, oh my God, welcome to the hamster wheel of pain. That type of, you know, that that um, sort of unforgiving nature. Creativity is absolutely sales to success. Excellent point. Trying to prove the bully's wrong. I want to know more about that. Stay tuned about that, Alex. I want to ask you about that. When we have, uh, when we come from a family that is both um, controlling and critical, and then uh, overly uh, uh, full of praise, that uh, psychological dynamic breeds imposter syndrome as well. So when the Stanford research tells me that upwards of 70 to 80% of the population suffers from imposter syndrome, it makes sense because I tell you the high percentage of families that either have alcoholism, controlling, overly praise, you know, perfectionism, all of that are huge are huge. In fact, one social scientist uh, uh, recalled the time she every year she goes to the freshman class of MIT, Yale and Harvard. And she asks that incoming class, how many people here believe that they are the one mistake that the admissions department made, right? That you shouldn't be here. How did I get to this Ivy League? How am I here? And she says, without fail, Every year, two thirds of the hands go up. 
You know, we are not alone. This is a deeply human uh, and extremely common, uh, extremely common uh, syndrome. And yet, because it thrives in darkness, part of the management of it is destigmatizing it and our ability to talk about it, to talk openly about it. So, you know, again, my thanks to this organization for allowing us to do just that because how we confront it how we can then become uh, invested and equipped with some very specific interventions to be able to combat and manage it are what we are going to do today using this oh my goodness why on earth would we be talking about improv being a mother is so difficult with this because Oh, Lisa, I could have a coffee with you. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> how much do I? How much do I love you? For our recording, I want to share. Um, uh, Lisa shares, if you will, if you if you don't mind, if I may, Lisa. Being a mother is so difficult with this at play because we naturally pass the need for perfection. Oh, I lost it. Um, but a need for uh, perfection in our actions while trying to perfectly accept our children. Oh, how true is that? Really, Julie? Julie, quickly. Okay, I'm in good time. Julie, quickly share that story. Unmute yourself and share that story. If you wish. How many, how many in their life had were told that they would not uh, would would not succeed. She, Julie shares a story about, oh, you don't have a microphone. Okay, no bad. She's not refusing to. She's just saying, wish she could. She shares in the chat that her admissions counselor told her she would get eaten up by the other artists in the program because they don't look like the typical artist. Oh my goodness. When we are told from an early age, right, Anita? Yeah. Um, when we are told who we are and who we are not, we internalize that identity. And so interestingly, as we grow into our creative careers, very often we can have this self-sabotaging behavior and limiting belief that we can't be an artist and have business acumen at the same time, right? Somehow those are uh, disconnected. And, and I can't be a true artist if I also have a, an entrepreneurial bent to me or I'm I'm really good at invoicing or or taxes or something right like a, a, you can't be both we can we can self-identify and limit our own beliefs going forward what we do with improv as I said to a group of Princeton physicists it's like a laboratory where we get to experiment with different states of being Taking a page out of the actor's playbook, we get to experience and feel different ways. And despite initially thinking, huh, like this makes no sense, when we connect and when we identify with each other and we laugh and we experience that, that sameness and that understanding through laughter, it delivers the aha moments. Victor Borgia once said famously, the closest, the shortest distance between two people is laughter. That is largely why it is so important. And it has some substantial psychological value to it as well. The APA, the American Psychological Association, looks at all of the different ways that uh, improv builds adaptability and resilience, that, that we accept and embrace the change and the adaptability and the uncertainty. We have a flexibility to it. it. There's a great amount of positive psychology in the extent and process of gratitude and appreciation, and we make connections. How many people here have heard of these two words as it relates to improv? I know Kami has. <laughs> Good, really? Tell me, please share with me what this means. Anyone just unmute themselves. What does yes and mean? I'll say it's the power of removing the, the yes, but the countering, the critical and always looking for possibilities and opportunities. Oh, 
possibilities and opportunities. Helene, thank you. That's so great. That's so great. Um, yes, and is the fundamental rule of improvisational theater. As you know, an improv scene does not have a set design or props or costumes. We have to make our environment. We have to, uh, we have to connect with, you know, nothing but our emotions, our intention. And while improv looks like we're just making something up on the fly, in actual fact, there is this fundamental rule that allows that to happen. So when uh, when Helene and I are on stage together and we are going to create a scene, if I come on stage and Helene is, say she's in a sailboat, you know, and she says, jump on, jump on. I do not deny that reality. I accept that is the yes. I accept what is, what is. Doesn't necessarily mean I have to like it, but I must accept it as the reality that has been created. The and, yes, and, I not only say yes, we're on a sailboat, I say and, and I say yes, and here comes the north wind, and you know, and away we go in the scene. You might think that this is overly simplistic and I guarantee you it's not. Part of, the, part of what the first bit of managing imposter syndrome is to accept that that is what it is. You know, um, Albert Einstein famously said, man should look at what is not at what he wants there to be. We get invested in, oh, I wish I didn't feel this way or I wish this wasn't the way it was. And the only way we can confront and combat imposter syndrome is when we can define it, when we acknowledge it, when we accept it and embrace it for what it is. Only then can we pivot strategically to be able to manage it. From a pedagogical point of view, pedagogy, the science of how we learn, yes and is an interesting principle. Yes is an experience in vulnerability. You know, I, I don't know what I'm saying yes to, but I know that that's the rule, that's what I've got to do, so that is where I have to go. And is where I use my voice to advance or heighten the scene. And that is an experience in empowerment that I get to contribute my thoughts, my imagination. And this two scaffolding concepts, the vulnerability, empowerment, vulnerability, empowerment, vulnerability, empowerment is how humans learn. It is the process of learning everything. And so with that, we are going to play a yes and game. A yes and game. You're just going to have a uh, you're just going to have a quick conversation. I need two. I need two volunteers. You're just going to uh, we're going to get a topic in the chat about what you are going to uh, have a conversation about, and the and you're going to go back and forth and back and forth saying yes and and build upon that conversation that topic. Give me two. I already know everybody could rock this. So. Uh, so throw me some volunteers or I can maybe ask. Okay, I'm asking Anita and Lisa. I don't even know. Anita and Lisa, please unmute yourself. And the rest of you, please give me a topic in the chat. What, what, are, the, what are we going to see this scene about uh, on this yes and improv scene? Throw it in the chat. What what does Lisa, what do Lisa? Oh, I'm sorry, Anita. I beg your pardon. I did know that. Uh, New Year's Eve plans, Jessica. That is our topic. Okay. So who else am I going to ask then? Swimming in shark and so on. I don't think I've ever had that, Helene. That is a great, that is a great offer. Um, all right, David, you're up. You're gonna, you're gonna play with us, David. Wonderful. And Lisa, are you good to play along with a quick little yes and exercise? Sure, I'll give it a try. You're awesome. Great. Thanks. Okay, your offer is New Year's Eve plan. Uh, your New Year's Eve plans. Uh, David, you start it off and then um, your partner will say yes and, and you go back and forth. 
Okay. Easy as pie. Away you go. Okay, so uh, for this New Year's Eve, I was thinking about all of the wonderful ways I would celebrate the, the new year. And one of the ideas I've had is to rent a gold car and <laughs> drive it around the, the streets of Hamilton. Have you ever thought about doing something like that? Yes. And the reflection of the lights in the gold of the car would be so beautiful. I, I, I would want to also include some kind of caroling, perhaps um, getting a megaphone. Do, do you have access to a megaphone or any ideas around that? Yes. And, and I think I think I could talk to my friend Jim who uh he actually has a stage in his in his backyard with lights and uh, and a band pit and so we could ask Jim to to get involved uh, do you have any thoughts about about different performers we could or different performances we could include in that yes I I really imagine um maybe an eclectic assortment of um, even a marching band coming through at one point. Um, that, that seems celebratory to me for for New Year's Eve. And uh, then there's the the fireworks piece. I, I don't know if you can help me with that at all. Yes, I, I know someone who who uh, invented a firework that goes off and it creates all sorts of different zoo animals in the sky and uh and the the big finisher is this blue whale that sweeps down and 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 everyone gets enveloped into the the whale's mouth and it's it's quite a big finish i'm not sure if you have you seen anything like that before yes i i i can't say that i've seen exactly that but i identify with the whale like i think Part of my internal narrative is to be swept up into a whale with all the people I enjoy where we can just hang out in that whale and and have a great time so I love the symbolism of that yay and scene and scene let's give the sign language for applause for these two amazing players how great was that excellent I just job to say I that I want to hang out with David and Lisa on New Year's, I'm in. <laughs> right, Sheila? <laughs> Look how well you did. You not only gave it, like right off the bat, Lisa, right off the bat, you talked about the, yes, David, the idea and the reflections that would come from, from that car. And then, and uh, and how about some caroling, right? And then David, right back, right back with reciprocity. You said, I know, I, I know a guy named Jim. I know a guy named Jim. And, and before you know it, we've got a stage and then a marching band and fireworks and animals. And that is how, that is how that works. Yes, and yes and there's a great um there's a great ted talk called your brain on improv and uh it's by dr charles lim from berkeley he used to be at johns hopkins he's moved to berkeley he did fmri studies you know the 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 um imaging machine and he found parts of the brain that were um that lit up or uh were um oh the word escapes me that um we're reduced <laughs> when we are in a creative and an improvised, improvised state of mind. Dr. Charles Lim found that when we are being creative, when we are improvising, when we are tapping that spontaneity and that playfulness, the part of the brain that is suppressed, that's the word I was looking for, the part of the brain that is suppressed is the lateral prefrontal cortex. The lateral prefrontal cortex is part of the brain that is in charge of self-monitoring, the judgment, you know, don't go there, careful, careful what you say. When we play, when we improvise, when we create, understandably, that is suppressed. What lights up is the medial prefrontal cortex. That is the part of the brain that is responsible for, among other things, self-expression and closely aligned to feelings of freedom closely aligned to feelings of freedom. So I, I love how well you did that. Um, beautiful job. Yes. And 
Yes, and and one of my participants talked early when I asked about this about the difference between uh, when I asked about yes and she brought up the important point of yes but 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 oh my God if I could eliminate a word from the English language it would be this word but is the speed bump to alignment in our relationships with our work with ourselves yes but yes but is still a no right? It's a polite no. It's a Canadian no. Yes, but that's not going to work. Yes, but, you know, and we find this deconstructive way of thinking uh, and we find reasons for why that won't work. I'm a success, but I got lucky, right? I got, uh, th that worked out, but, you know, things just, circumstances allowed me to, right? But nasty part of the imposter syndrome inner voice. So that's yes and. The second rule of improv in an ensemble mindset is I've got your back. I've got your back. It is my job on an improv stage to take care of you. In only, and the only way that I do that is by listening to you. And when I listen to you, when my focus, when my attention is on you, I do not have the time, energy, or inclination to listen to my self-centered, obsessive, anxiety-ridden self. I just don't. In fact, here at St. Joe's Healthcare in, in Hamilton, we have a clinical trial that has recently been published in Synapse, the journal for psychology, behavior, and neuroscience, where we lowered social anxiety disorder with a 12-week improv boot camp with at-risk youth at the Youth Wellness Center at St. Joe's. The, the, I, I say self-centeredness with love and compassion in my heart. You know, part of being uh, ridden or, or um, part of the, the paralyzing grip that social anxiety disorder can have on us is this obsession with self. And so when as an improv player, I don't have time to worry about me. I just worry about you. Remarkable things happen. I listen differently and I hear things that I would otherwise miss, right? Um, listening is a sacrificial act. Listening is a sacrificial act. I, I allow myself to be changed as a result of what I just heard. But humans, especially, we are conditioned to listen only well enough until we think we know what the person is talking about, and then we jump in. We, part of why we are living in such a politically polarized society is that we do not, we have a very hard time listening to each other. I've got your back, ensemble mindset, being able to give to the other. Let's play again. Actually, we're going to go into adaptability a little bit because I want to share uh, I want to share this superpower, this superpower. So we all know, um, we, we all know what IQ is, intelligence. Sorry, Nancy. Yeah. I just have a question. Anything, Sheila. Um, I'm just thinking about that, yes, and in a situation, like a business situation where perhaps what the person is suggesting um, may not be working into the framework. And... I'm wondering if you can give an example of that where you say yes and whatever to, to help it keep them encouraged and engaged, but um, where you're not able, for whatever reason, it's not plausible to actually, uh, you know, have circus clowns in a gold car on New Year's Eve kind of thing. <laughs> Okay, Although so I that's exactly left point. out the circus clowns, which disappointed me, quite frankly. <laughs> so, um, Sheila, what you ventured into is uh, negotiation tactics, whereby we say what the the yes is the acknowledgement of what is right, and in order to be able to have the the creative problem solving or the collaborative. Uh, process between two people, we still must have an acceptance of and a clarity of what, as your example, what that client may want. You know, the and comes in the form of options given, but also from a negotiating point of view, 
uh, we did um, Harvard's PON program, the program on negotiation. And there is a way to handle yourself in this type of negotiation and conversation that is fascinating. Keeping your hand on the rudder of this conversation means that you ask tactical questions. And that's a whole other workshop, friend. The um, How can I summarize this? Um, the and is needing to get to know more information, more data, so that a collaborative compromise and a, and a decision can be had. But it and it uh, inhibits you from saying, "Oh my God, you want clown like WTF? You need this and you want that and like this." And and it does not shut down the creative problem solving process. Still, the yes and allows for, as someone said earlier as well, potential and possibility, potential and possibility. And, yet, and as I also said earlier, yes and doesn't mean that I have to like it, right? Yes and, oh my God, my client wants those four deliverables by Thursday, right? I simply accept it and this is what I can do. Right, keeping that uh, keeping that um, sense of boundary and uh, and what I am, my, both my creativity and the limits of that creativity, in an honest rapport. Um, hold that thought because I'm going to come back. I'm going to come back to it in a minute. Anyone <laughs> else? Anyone else want to add to that? Okay, um, it is a um, it is a valid and important question, and more of a tactic, as I say, around how we negotiate. You want to know how to uh, negotiate well? Know the right questions to ask. Is the quick summary of that, and it is fascinating. I have, and I tell you, it doesn't. It, it not only works well for clients. It's really good in a marriage. It's very good. It's very good with teenage children, right? Know the type of questions to ask in order to elicit and give insight to the other, right? Because the other, the person, the client, whomever, um, may or may not be aware of what he or she is asking. And they need clarification on what they need as well. Oh, I'm going to go down a bad hole if I go any further. Adaptability. Adaptability. Um, as a skill, adaptability has gone from interesting to important. Um, it was back in 2011 that the Harvard Business Review wrote this, the, their seminal article called Adaptability, Your New Competitive Advantage. And every single year since then, we have been, it has been climbing the rungs of the most essential skill. There is a the new social science metric. We, we know IQ, and since it was developed at Yale over 25 years ago now, EQ, or emotional intelligence, emotional quotient, has been uh, embedded in a lot of organizations and leadership program and giving real insight into how we think, metacognition, how we think about thinking right? Um, how we learn, understanding how we learn changes the way we do it. So AQ is a monster of a, it is very important. And there is a new social science metric for this as well. And learning how we, how we navigate ourselves and our imposter syndrome through the uncertainty, because those waters are choppy, the imposter syndrome volume can get deafening. It is a cacophony of, of inner criticism. And so how we maneuver and how we adapt, under what conditions we adapt, you know, our ability to adapt, is worthy of our time and attention. And there are some tactical things that we can learn. Adaptability is based on something called the ACE model. And that is too small a slide. The ACE model is uh, an acronym for ability, um, how and to what extent do we adapt? And underneath ability are five components. Um, the social science metric has in it, under our ability, things like grit, resiliency, the ability to unlearn, 
our our uh, mindset, our growth versus a fixed mindset. Some of you might be familiar with Carol Dweck's work on that. And mental flexibility, mental flexibility. I cannot tell you how important this is. Mental flexibility is that ability that we have whereby we are able to hold two uh, opposing views in balance, right? That is what is going to give us the ability to combat the inner critic mental flexibility, two opposing concepts in equal balance. Law students, law schools do a very good job at teaching uh, um, mental flexibility. The ACE model, the C stands for character. Who adapts and why? You know, under what type of, um, uh, and under this component, they have things like our, um, our thinking style, our motivation style, our emotional range, and fascinating to me is hope. Hope. People with a higher level of hope are, um, oh my goodness, I, the, the science of hope fascinates me. Uh, Sean, uh, Shane Lopez is a big researcher in hope. Very often you'll hear in an organization that says, uh, hope is not a strategy. Hope is not a strategy. And I get that. I understand what they're saying. But I tell you, hope is tactical because people with a higher level of hope are able to withstand and bear inevitable speed bumps and, and, and shortfalls in their goal setting. People with higher levels of hope are able to identify and surmount the number of obstacles that come their way. Hope, love hope. I tell you, whoever my friend, Lisa, uh, you, you want to instill a superpower in your, in your children, make them hopeful. Understand what that is. And I got a couple articles if you want um, anyone, anyone on any, anything that I share today, feel free to reach out and I will share environment huge huge under what conditions are we more likely to adapt what is our work stress what is our team support what's our company support what's our what's our emotional health what is our what is our work stress the ace model is adaptability the so we're going to i'm going to take some key components of adaptability and we're and as they relate to imposter syndrome, and we're going to play with this a little bit. We're going to play with this a little bit. The um, forgive my have I got there? We go. I got that spot off. Little anal retentive. Make sure things are perfect. The <laughs> resiliency, resiliency. Um, oh my goodness! So the research shows that resiliency is a muscle that needs to be flexed. If we have a perfectionist attitude, we do not allow failure. And I tell you what a self-fulfilling prophecy and self-sabotage we are leading up to if we have that, if we have that. We are fragile if we do not fail. We have no experience of allowing ourselves the, 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 the uh, ability to get back up. You want to raise resilient children? Let them fail let them fail. The famous improviser Del Close says, fall, fall, and figure out what to do on the way down. You know, resiliency is character building. Resilience, looking at what you can do in that, in that process is, um, is soul enhancing. It is, um, and Tina Fey uh, famously says, you know, her resilience was built from letting go of her perfectionism. She says, It'll never be perfect. And perfection is overrated. And perfection is boring. And it is. It is. There, A, there is no such thing. And as Keith, uh, as Keith Johnstone says, the truth is funnier. The truth is funny. Um, the discovery, the observation, and our human reaction is much better than any type of contrived invention. So giving ourselves the permission to be human and understanding that part of resilience is falling and failing and getting back up, that is what we do. And sometimes resilience looks, can appear to us in different ways. Sometimes like the strength of a trunk, we are resilient and nothing can 
uh, can push us over. Sometimes resilience is like a reed in the wind and we have to fall and get back up. And sometimes resilience is adaptable and the root structure adapts to our environment and we survive. How much do I love that quote? Have no fear of perfection, you'll never reach it. Oh, Anita, you're the best. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm behind in my chat. Oh, you're great. So wonderful. Thank you, Lisa. You're all good. Okay, so here's a game in resilience. My next two volunteers, please. I am going to necessarily jar you and put you in a state of discomfort, which is the point right? And um, this is an easy, simple exercise. It's often used in product development, brain, corporate brainstorming, team building. It's a simple game called should have said. I should have said. What's going to happen is I'm going to get two volunteers. They're going to start a little improv, improv conversation, and they're going to go back and forth and back and forth in short little, short little sentences. And every once in a while, I'm going to call out should have said. You simply change the last thing you said. Instead of saying, you know, the black cat crossed my path, saying, you know, oh my God, there was a gorilla in the trees. I don't know. Like, you're just, you're just going to change the last thing you said. And you are going to take it back and say something else. Easy. And it's a little jarring. So please share. Please volunteer. Who's, who's coming in for this? Come on. You can do it. Everyone gets a chance here. Uh, we're, we're in good time and we've got 40 minutes to go. There are more improv exercises to elucidate, to, to explain the social science concepts here. Uh, Jessica and, here, all taken. Yay, Jess, and, awesome, and, welcome, and welcome. LA has, has their hand raised. Oh, thank you for being my tech support. Sorry, I didn't I don't see the hand raised, raised, David, thank you. <laughs> all right, um, uh, I'm not even gonna get um, I'm not even going to get an offer. So I beg your pardon. We've got Jessica and who is our other player? LA. LA. Lovely name. Okay. LA, you're going to start. You're going to start and you're just going to, uh, start saying something and you're going to have a conversation back and forth with Jess. Please begin. Sorry, I, I just wanted to apologize. My name is Lil America. <laughs> but oh, I'm I, so, I, I, thank <laughs> you. Thank you. <laughs> Good. Sorry. Advocating. Okay, so um, today I I I woke up really early. I dropped off my son, and the road was really icy. Good. That's enough. That's awesome. We need a okay. short cut, and the road. I woke up early. My son, and the road was icy. Awesome job. Great start. Jess, over to you. Well, little America, I told you to put snow tires on your car. Oh, a good recommendation. Actually, I still have all seasons. I can't believe I, I told you about the guy, he was going to give me the free tires and I offered them to you. So I still got them in my garage. Free tires. Yeah. Yeah, they're all wrapped up and I hope they fit your car. And he said no questions. So I didn't Should've ask said. any. Should have said, Lise, take that back. Free tires. Oh. Now respond to that. Oh, sorry. No, not 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 tires in the garage. So I got tires. Um, a bicycle. It was my bicycle that was in the garage. I was going to offer you my bicycle. Sorry. Oh, okay. Do, do you have tires for bicycle or tires? No tires at all. Well, there are some tires. They might be for the bicycle. I, I haven't. Oh, I do have me. a bicycle. Okay. Well, I might have tires. <laughs> <laughs> Good. So let me know when can I pick them up? Should have said. Should have said. Take that back, Lil. Uh, should I said, uh, I'm walking to your place and I will uh, bring a Christmas gift to you if you give me the bicycle, the uh, tires. Well, I, I do I do like Christmas gifts and I, wonderful to see you. I'm, I'm here all day, but um, you remember the thing about the bear? I just look out oh. for the bear. Yeah, bears are dangerous. Thank uh, you for telling me that. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not sure that he's dangerous so much as he just really hates Christmas carolers. Should have said. I'm not, not Christmas carolers. I can't believe I said Christmas carolers. I, I, I meant uh, small children. 
like the little ones, the ankle biters, sorry. But you're, you should be good. Sorry, how old is your kid? 15. Oh, yeah, no that? problem. Yeah. How old is your no, You'll be fine. Okay, perfect. So it's a done deal. <laughs> okay. All right, scene, 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 scene. Big applause for our players. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Little America and Jessica, you're awesome. Thank you. Um, okay, what I love to see, what I love to witness, first of all, may I thank you, David. Um, what did you notice in any nonverbal behavior through that interaction? Talk to me, uh, give me a comment or an observation for what we just saw. Yeah, thanks, Jess. It was so well done. And what what we um, we s witnessed the intentional uh, sort of the 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 mental speed bump over, you know, oh, OK, go back. But what I especially loved, Lil America, I hope I pronounced that L.A., I hope I pronounced that correctly. When she said, uh, when she had to should have said, and she took something back, she looked, uh, she looked back, she looked concerned, and then she delivered her next line with delight. It's like, oh, okay, I'm coming over to your place, right? Okay, and it was like, it was even better. It was even better. Um, human beings, suffice to say that human beings have a brain that is essentially lazy. We love the neuro wiring. Um, you know, what, what, fires, uh, what fires together, wires together. And pushing ourselves out of the comfort zone and forcing ourselves to think differently, have a different response, gives us an opportunity to appreciate and see different perspectives and points of view. This is, a, it's a fun dinner game. You can play it anywhere and it pushes us. It's a great game for uh, further diversity and inclusion as well. Looking at different perspectives, appreciating a different point of view. I love this word, unlearning. It is not so much that we need to learn a new way to confront and combat this imposter syndrome. It is much more a process of unlearning where we have come from and what we need to reframe in our mind, reframe in our mind. I would love it if anyone could give me an example of something that they have had to unlearn in their life. And it is significant because we are given an opportunity to see more, look at things differently, look at ourselves differently. What is something that you have had to unlearn? I, I can share that I've, I've had to unlearn um, the message to myself that I'm not worthy of, of being cared for. And that unless I care for others over and above what is sometimes humanly possible, um, that I don't have to do that to receive care. And, and I, I really have to talk kindly to my brain. And um, I call that voice in my brain, Lucy. That when Lucy gets all wild telling me that I'm not worthy, I have to, I have to talk to her kindly and tell her just to be quiet because uh, Lisa doesn't need her right now. I love that you do that. That is a tactic. There are, uh, we can personify our voices, the one that gives us the toxic criticism and the one that gives us self-compassion, Lucy. And I love that you speak to Lucy with, with kindness, you know, not now, Lucy, I'm good. I've got this, right? And unlearning something, Lisa, I love that you share that. L unlearning something as so fundamental as worthiness, right, is transformational. Brene Brown does a huge body of research in this regard as well, when she talks about belonging and, and managing our shame and the vulnerability of that. How did I get here without, with, with, while I manage feelings of unworthiness? That's such a beautiful example. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. 
unlearning. It is, um, it is largely why many organizations are um, stymied. Their, their inability to unlearn is largely why so many organizations are stymied in, their, in meeting their diversity, equity, and inclusion goals. You know, they, they have this checkbox of, of compliance, and it doesn't have anything to do with that. It is culture. It is culture, not compliance, and they have not unlearned what they need to unlearn before they enact on a new way of thinking and listening and seeing the other. Okay, my next slide after this one, and I say, and of course, transformation is often more about unlearning than learning. The next slide, all I need a volunteer to do is read the slide, just read the slide, and it's easy peasy. The next slide is full of uh, colors uh, the, and it, the written word, blue, green, red, yellow, that's it, right? And all I need to, thank you, and need, oh, need to get, <laughs> you have a mic, can you do it? Have I got the wrong person? Nope, oh shoot. Okay, someone, I thought so, you smart Alec. Okay, who is going to, who am I gonna, Alex? Alex, please come out and uh, it's so easy. All you have to do is read the slide. However, what I need you to do is not read the letters on the screen. I need you to read the color. So if blue, the word blue is in red, I don't need you to read blue. I want you to say red. That's it. Easy. Ready, Alex? Yeah. <laughs> 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 I love that you're laughing. I love that you're laughing. It is easy. Okay. One, two, three, go. Oh, okay. Thanks. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Red, blue. Um, that's yellow and purple, yellow, blue, green, red, green, uh, red, purple, blue, blue, red, green, yellow red, orange, uh, nope, <laughs> green, <laughs> green, uh, yellow, uh, purple, yellow, blue, purple, green, purple, green, uh, yellow, <laughs> red, blue, red, what am I, oh, uh, purple, red, green, and yellow. Wow, that's actually mine. <laughs> Say again, that's actually what? I didn't hear you. <laughs> it's a mind trick. Holy. Isn't it though? Isn't it though? That quick and easy exercise allows you to experience what it feels like to unlearn. What it feels like. It was a great job, David. Thanks. Okay, how many people here played along in their head with Alex? Right. Every yeah, every we had you. We had your back. It was like and and I love I always love listening to people when they do this, because it's like they you can hear the translation neurologically in their brain. They see blue, but it's red, green, yellow, red. Blue, and, and you feel that bump. That is exactly what what. It is supposed to feel like you did an awesome job, and that was exactly what we wanted here. Um, if anybody wants these slides or wants to play with this, like it's a, um, there's lots of tactics that we need to uh, that we need to learn in order to unlearn. Uh, the best thing that we can do, thank you, you're awesome, Alex. The best thing that we can do to unlearn is to embrace curiosity embrace curiosity, question things, question things, which, by the way, as creatives, that is one of our uh, incredible benefits that we give to the business sector, that we are much more curious, we question why things are, and we have a much better ability to create a problem solve. I was speaking with an artist uh, a couple days ago, and she said she identifies herself as an artist and not a business person. So we had a good conversation about that. You know, how do you unlearn that identity? 
right? Because by saying that I'm not good at that, it gave her it gave her this uh, sort of ready-made excuse for being late with taxes and being late with invoices and not doing a good job with admin and having a messy workspace and all of this, right? She says, oh, that's just, that's not part of me. And so to make a long story short, what she ended up doing was instilling a little bit of creativity into that paperwork. And so with every invoice that she now sends out, she, she does so in a creative and artistic way. She, her invoice looks differently. It looks different. And at the bottom of her invoice, right under the HST number, is a lesson that she learned a lesson that she learned from working with this client, you know, your commissioned work gave me this, you know, this is what I loved about your, your organization and your values and what you, you know, and, and I tell you, it not only gave her this merging of the identities of being a creative and having an, in, being an individual with such business acumen, but it turned out to be an amazing business development tool and you know, anytime you can jar accounts receivable, it's a good day, right? So I love that. I love that she's learning to unlearn by merging these identities together. Alex, you're awesome. You're awesome. You're awesome. Great job. Back to my slides. It's tough, right? Like it's, it's um, especially since the first two lines are in sync, they are aligned. Both the letters and the colors are the same. I've tried this and I've never sort of done it in a very fast, fluid, fluid manner. Okay, now I want to talk to you. Earlier, I mentioned this mental flexibility to um, that ability to hold two seemingly opposing ideas or concepts in balance. And the psychologist, the social science talks about the difference between cognitive flexibility and mental shift, mental shift, how we unlearn, how are we, how do we process thinking of ourselves differently and how do we manage something like imposter syndrome. And I want to share with you that what the research has, says, just to clarify the difference, because they are used interchangeably and they're close but different. Mental shifting is the main component of cognitive flexibility. And it's so closely related that they're often referred to in the same concept. However, cognitive flexibility talks about the ability to adapt to a change while mental shifting is the process that makes it possible. Mental flexibility. Um, as I mentioned earlier, law schools uh, do this very well. And they are able to, uh, in law schools, uh, they don't have improv exercises. Well, they do, but they, um, they have what they call drills. And a law student will, uh, argue uh, an issue, you know, capital punishment or euthanasia or something like that. And then a bell will ring and they must immediately start arguing the opposing side. And the best lawyers in the world will often say that they're, they win because they know the argument of their opposing counsel better than they know their own argument. This has huge return on investment. When we are able to um, cognitively, objectively, forcefully look at um, the opposing view, the other side, then what that gives us is the objectivity and the cognitive and emotional investment in looking at that imposter syndrome with clearer eyes. You know, what evidence do I give to believe that I am unworthy or that I should not be here? or that um, it was attributed, my success is attributed to luck. What evidence is that? And so a fun quick little uh, exercise around mental flexibility and how we can play back and forth with two opposing sides is a quick and easy, uh, is a quick and easy exercise called fortunately, unfortunately, fortunately, unfortunately. We're gonna get, um, uh, we're going to get a, two volunteers and we're going to talk about um, thin crust versus thick crust. That is our law school's type 
argument, our, our opposing sides, and one person is going to say, fortunately, this is you know, what I believe, the second pl player B will start his or her argument with say, unfortunately. And then we're gonna switch and the other and the individuals who were saying fortunately now have to start their conversation with unfortunately. And I'll side coach and, and you'll be awesome and it's all good. Who are, who have I not? Kami, I have not heard from you. Unmute yourself, friend. There you are. Will you play along? I'm here, absolutely, my pleasure. Woman after my own heart. How much do I love? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. You're awesome. Okay, who else? Who else? Who have I not heard from? Let me see. Who is this Martin Watson? I do not know you. Come on, come play. Are you there? Yes. All right. Okay. Awesome. All right, friends, this exercise is called Fortunately, Unfortunately. Um, Martin, you're going to start us off. You will have, um, you are going to say fortunately, and then you're going to say something, anything that comes to mind. You're going to improvise a point around thin crust or thick crust, whatever. Um, Kami, you will then say, you will start by saying, unfortunately, and you're just going to go back and forth and back and forth. Okay. And then when I call out switch, Martin will start to say, unfortunately, and Kami will start her lines with fortunately. Got yeah. it? Yeah. You're awesome. Uh, Martin, away you'd go. Thank you, sir. Well, fortunately, the thick crust provides a very large platform to add all the toppings that you want. You get to pick vegetarian, Hawaiian, meat lovers, Canadian, your choice. Unfortunately, the thick crust can be so gooey. And if it's not cooked right, it's going to get all clogged up in your mouth and your teeth. And it, it's, it's really hard to chew. And you have to have a really good pizza maker to make it like the right consistency. It's, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a hard thing to make a really good thick crust. I can only think of one really good place in the city here, Chicago pizza. But, but they're always packed there it's hard to get in they are the ones that make the best thick crust so unfortunately it's a really hard thing to have a really good thick crust it's it's really hard you have to cook it right it's difficult <laughs> you're awesome okay over to you martin now am i going with fortunately or yeah keep going <laughs> fortunately fortunately well, fortunately, I haven't had that experience. Fortunately, okay. I've experienced the gold standard of various pizza makers. And uh, fortunately, luckily, the opportunities of creating different types of pizza keeps everybody happy. And fortunately, the thick crust. <laughs> fortunately, the thick crust can um, be minimized to a thinner crust upon Good. request. Nice, nice. Unfortunately, Kami. Well, unfortunately, I don't know if we're talking about thick or thin now. <laughs> My brain gets so scrambled with all this pizza talk and it's making me very, very, very hungry. Awesome, that's great. Martin, back to you. <laughs> Well, fortunately, you are hungry and uh, you Good. Know, for your Chicago place. And fortunately, I think you live close to it. Is that correct? Okay, now switch. Now say fortunately, Kami, and unfortunately, Martin. Well, fortunately, yes. And you know what? You can deliver. It, it's a good thing. You can, they, they do take out. So that's a really good thing. Because fortunately, it is worth the wait. Even though it takes an hour, it's worth the wait. You'll love it. Have you tried it? 
Well, I think, well, unfortunately, I live outside their delivery area. <laughs> unfortunately, you know, it snowed this morning. And unfortunately, I didn't put my snow tires on yet. And unfortunately, my bicycle doesn't have its snow tires either. <laughs> so, well, fortunately, fortunately, I have a car. I could go pick it up for you. <laughs> you Yay. have to do the so you could get to try this amazing Chicago style thick breast pizza. You'll love you it. And scene. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. 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 Thank you both. That was um, um, Martin. Oh, I don't know why thing. I haven't. Just, unfortunately, I'm on a diet. <laughs> Oh, I love that he needed the last word. I love that <laughs> you needed to, you close that. You had a good closing <laughs> Um, And I love that. May we just take a moment for appreciating that Martin gave a callback to an yeah. earlier scene with yeah. the bicycle tires, yeah. you clever man. Um, <laughs> Amy, how much do I love your commitment and your character? You're, you've got such a background in acting, right? You, you were, <laughs> Building that, building that on, and you were given the whole damn story. I love it. Um, yes, fantastic. Great job, guys. Lots of love in the chat. Thank you. So great. Um, interestingly, when we get, uh, when we develop the mental flexibility, the um, to hold two seemingly opposing ideas in balance, it will come. It will come naturally to us because we have bias, our unconscious bias, that some things will appear fortunate and unfortunate. Challenge that, switch it. And um, whether it's thick crust, thin crust, or chocolate versus vanilla, or you know whatever, there are ways that we can train our brain to become more, uh, more objective and allow that mental flexibility. It is huge. It is a very, very important skill. Um, in the social science metric of adaptability quotient, there is a very high correlation between the ability to unlearn and mental flexibility. And of all the 17 components that make up that social science metric, what, the ones that um, are deeply correlated with all others are, the, the most powerful one is hope. Hope. Oh, you're so good. You're all so good. Um, adaptability, it is a superpower. It is a superpower and one that should continue to sort of command our time and attention because as we, as we progress in society, um, we are going to see more change in the next 10 years than we have had in the last 100. And I dare say that that is really hard to wrap our heads around, you know? I mean, just think of what life must have been like in 1921. But we have a rate of change, this exponential rate of change that is absolutely unprecedented. And so in order to fortify and to armor ourselves and our children and our organizations and our future careers, we must understand truly how we are adaptable, under what circumstances are, are we adaptable? Because this is uh, from Thomas Friedel, um, uh, his work, and he looks at the um, human adaptability. This is the rate of change. This is time. And over the course of time, humans adapt. It is what we do. You know, Charles Darwin uh, did not say in his um, theory of the, the survival of the fittest, he was not talking about the fastest or the strongest. He said those who survive are those who learn to adapt. And indeed, the no truer words are spoken in 2021. Technology, the rate of change of technology, whether it's driverless cars or the massive disruption that will that that is happening right now and will continue to have five years from now, things will look dramatically different. Um, and indeed, while his initial research out of the University of Chicago put us here and above human adaptability, others are saying we're closer to about this point, that the, that the pandemic has really accelerated technological change and hence the uh, necessity for, uh, for adaptability. With imposter syndrome, we drop anchor in who we think we are. Understanding how we can become adaptable, malleable, flexible, and 
importantly, full, full of self-compassion, like Lisa shared, we get to reframe our worthiness, our growth mindset, our ability to adapt. Um, two big, uh, big researchers in human adaptability, uh, they define it as the capacity to adjust one's thoughts and behaviors in order to effectively respond to uncertainty. And one of the things that, you know, why something like improv and play and creativity, why this is beautiful training ground to instill and cultivate more adaptability is that we have the opportunity to understand the difference between a reaction and a response. And I promise you the difference is huge, is huge. As opposed to the, that wiring, that self-sabotaging, that negative voice, and we immediately react with feelings of um, insecurity and, and threat, Having adaptability gives us this wonderful piece of pause, this silence, this ability to reflect and respond as opposed to react. Um, and the quotient, you know, from the uh, National Institutes for Health, it talks about how uh, imperative this, uh, this skill is. Um, I have in that, my last few moments here uh, um, an offer for uh, Hamilton Arts Council members. If you want to pursue this, if you want to um, elaborate on this a little bit more, there is uh, there is a discounted code for having an adaptability quotient assessment done and and a debrief. Finally, my friend, my friend Miguel Trepic. I suffer from imposter syndrome and I benefit from the tactics and interventions and creativity that we have played with today, you know, and I think that part of what I create is um, closely aligned with why I create, you know, um, when I was a little girl, I, um, I lived in a in a farm, in an old farmhouse north of, uh, north of Brampton. And we had a black and white television set in 1970 and I was six years old. And I used to watch this show on Saturday mornings. It was a show about gypsies. And it was, and I remember the opening of this show and it had the caravan and this community of nomadic gypsies traveled from town to town to town. And they would, and every episode was where they would stop at a town and they would, and they would perform and they would tell stories and they would make people laugh and connect. And very often they had a parable or a, or a moral to share. And then they would pack up and go to the next town. And I remember thinking, um, best job ever. <laughs> I thought, that's what I want to do. That's what I want to do. That is, it spoke to me. And I think being invested in the creative industries, we are, we are what we create. We have, we are often called to this profession because of something with purpose and meaning and, and deep internalization with both what we create and why we create it. Because that is so, it is more critical and imperative than ever that we manage imposter syndrome, you know, because it is, um, it is crippling, it costs us in our ability to create and to innovate, it aids, it, it contributes to these limiting beliefs that would have us say, well, I'm an artist, but not a business person, you know, I'm not allowed to make money if I'm an artist, what is that? Don't do that. Don't do that. The United Nations called 2021 the year of the creative economy, the year of the creative economy, because our contribution to society is great. And in the coming years, with this exponential rate of change, we are needed even more. We are needed even more. So um, share destigmatize this, 
okay? Destigmatize this, have a mentor and be able to understand that um, that sharing goes a long way to combating and managing this. You got five little pieces of homework in order to, in order to continue this. This is like the most boring slide ever. It's just, uh, just writing, but it's the way that it's the way that homework is usually, it's the way that homework is usually delivered. You have to be compassionate with yourself. For the love of God and all things holy, be kind, be kind to yourself. Anything else amplifies the, um, the Lucy's, right? I love that you shared that. The, the inner critic, right? And uh, Christian Neff out of UCLA does a tremendous amount of work in uh, self-compassion. It's fascinating. And, um, and the US Army has instilled her tactics for uh, soldiers to be self-compassionate. The NBA has her self-compassionate techniques, although they call it, you know, inner strength training, which, you know, whatever, it's the same thing. It's the same thing, it's just compassionate, but they had to give it a manly name. Um, self-compassion. Be kind, understand that this is hard and know that you are not alone because this is universal. 70 to 80% of the population suffer from imposter syndrome. Gratitude, gratitude is a superpower. Whenever I think that I am not enough, a great tactic is to appreciate what I have. And somehow it bridges, it bridges what I have to where I could be, where I want to go. Gratitude. May we want what we have. Compare with care. Um, the name escapes me, the American president. I think, I don't know if it's Lincoln. He said, um, comparison is the thief of joy. Shoot, I wish somebody Google that for me. Um, comparison is the thief of joy. When, yeah, you want to amplify your your imposter syndrome compare your insides with someone else with someone else's outsides you know understand that you know we think um this is what i know and this is what everyone else knows what all this is all their knowledge and it is um and I will compare that and it costs me. It is a complete and simple, quick, self-fulfilling prophecy. Roosevelt, Julia, you're awesome. I love this group. You are a wonderful, David and Sheila, you are just, I love this group you've compiled for me today. Track accomplishments, think like a lawyer, give evidence to the voice. How is that true? How could that not be true? Well, the client, you know, uh, um, two days ago, I had to give a, a speech on the spot and I did so and I, um, and poof, I did it just off the bat. And, but I didn't allow myself to appreciate that skill and gift that I was able to deliver some information to this organization that they found useful somehow because I didn't sweat and work and angst enough for it. I discounted it, track the accomplishments. And finally, David, I'm coming back to your ego. I mean, not your ego, friend. <laughs> I'm coming back to the necessity of ego management, forced humility. When we say, oh, I'm the worst imposter. Oh, I'm the, you know, I'm the biggest fraud. That is ego in reverse. You know, my business mentor would say, um, get over yourself. Get over yourself. You're not that important. You're not that bad. You're not that good. May we be, may we understand that our work, um, he is also the man who said, it is never about the job. It is always about the nature of the work. May we appreciate who we are. May we be both the art and the artist. And may we um, live with and manage our imposter syndrome effectively. Um, I think you have 130 on the nose. One, um, uh, I'm going to put my email in the chat if you want to uh, further the conversation or are curious about um, anything that I've talked about here today, whether it is the adaptability quotient or the research or, you know, something you're uh, curious about, reach out. Thank you. I knew you guys would. It's Roosevelt. It sounds more like a Roosevelt quote, too. 
Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. I've really enjoyed our time here. The 90 minutes flew.